a couple of weeks ago, Jan told me that uh, he wasn't going to give his talk. He delegated it to me. And this was going to be the topic of the talk, Mac Attack, the Rivers of Babylon. Um, we hadn't discussed the, the content of his talk at all, although we discuss everything about it at least once a day by FaceTime, most of the time more than once a day. We have lengthy discussions about everything. We didn't discuss the topic at all, so I had to come up with my own topic. Um, so after I had finished my slides, then we discussed it. So this is, this is my talk, not Jan's talk. Um, it was clear that I had to say something about Mac, and it was clear that I had to say something about Babylon. So I came up with a couple ideas. Um, there is a Mac Attack 1, and that is the title of an editorial by Steve Schaefer um, that was published in 2003. And what this editorial was about was really, well, was really about uh, the narrowness of the Mac curve. There is only a 10 to 15% variability among individuals when you determine Mac. Um, what about Babylon? I had to come up with something about Babylon. So first I had no idea what he meant with that, and then I looked up what Babylon was all about. And Babylon was uh, the, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was a construction that was intended to be made by the people of Babylon, and they wanted to build it so high that they would reach heaven. Now, God didn't like that, uh, because there should be no shortcut to heaven. So he introduced different languages among the engineers and the architect. So it would end up in a construction that was not functional, that was going to fall apart. And you can see that the construction at uh, closer to the top was becoming haphazard and the whole thing just fell apart. Um, this to me meant that there is something very important about uh, language, because it leads to the need for correct terminology and the need for strict definitions. If we don't use the correct definitions, then we cannot communicate effectively. So what about MAC? MAC, as we know, is the minimal alveolar concentration. It's the end tidal concentration uh, at which 50% of unparalyzed young, healthy males will not move after a noxious stimulus in the absence of any drug at steady state. That's the definition of MAC. That's the way it is. Um, we know that the curve, the MAC curve, is actually quite narrow. I'm not going to go into that at all. But we have different MAC values for different anesthetics. So what affects MAC? There is one clear factor that affects MAC, and this is the age. We have known very clearly that age does affect MAC. And if you look at younger individuals versus older individuals, uh, we can tell that uh, the MAC value or the concentration changed. So MAC is clearly affected by age. So is there something else that affects MAC? Um, there is a possibility that there are genetic factors um, and ethnicity that can affect MAC to a small degree. Um, but is there anything else? Anything else? Well, I don't think there is anything else. But what about disease states? Um, what about opioids? Don't, don't opioids affect MAC? And my answer to that is no. These do not affect MAC, because MAC is determined in healthy patients, not sick patients. And MAC has been determined in the absence of other drugs. Therefore, MAC is not affected by opioids in a strict definition of the word. There are some other conceptual issues with MAC also. For example, it's clear that the uh, minimal is a misnomer. It should have been median. 50% probability means there are 50% to the left of MAC and 50% to the right. It's clearly a median. It should have been called MAC immobility because we have, uh, we have created other MACs. And to differentiate MAC from the other MACs, we have to clarify that. So it should have been MAC immobility so that we can differentiate that 
from Mac Awake and Mac Bar. The importance of definitions. So Mac Immobility is about one, is, is one. Uh, Mac Awake is roughly 0.35, and Mac Bar is 1.3 to 2 Mac. And the reason for the larger variability in Mac Bar is that the definition of, of blockage of, of adrenergic response varies from author to author. Is it the 50% uh, or is it less than the 15% increase in heart rate or is it less than a 20% increase in heart rate? Or does blood pressure play a role also? Or do both conditions have to be uh, um, met in order to talk about blockage of adrenergic response? That's why we see that uh, variability. And also different potent inhaled anesthetics uh, also have a different effect on blockage of adrenergic response by themselves. So what about the effects of opioids on, on these MAC values? Um, so since MAC is determined in the absence of other drugs, MAC by them, uh, opioids by themselves cannot change the MAC value. They simply cannot. What um, opioids can do is that they can reduce the uh, alveolar partial pressure that results in the probability of unconsciousness or lack of movement or lack of autonomic or adrenergic response. So that we can say. This is kind of um, a more complex way of saying it. It's, it's technically based on the definitions. It's more correct. But we will continue to say that opioids reduce the MAC of anesthetics. Uh, although not correct, it's something that we have almost accepted. And it's hard to resist that. But I think we should. So in the presence of opioids, 2 nanograms um, per ml uh, plasma concentration of fentanyl, MAC awake on the left side is reduced by roughly 50%. See, I'm saying it myself already. Um, <coughs> the anesthetic requirement to, uh, to induce unconsciousness is reduced by about 15% in the presence of opioids. The, uh, the MAC is reduced by 50%, or MAC immobility, and MAC bar is reduced by 75%. We can't help ourselves, right? Um, so in, in my opinion, other drugs do not affect MAC. Um, they reduce the requirement of inhaled anesthetic to achieve a probability of a certain effect. So that's my first conclusion. Opioids and other drugs do not change MAC. There is something else about the definition of MAC that um, I felt needed some attention, and that's the 15-minute equilibration period. Why is that there? Um, this is a slide that I, I did actually take from Jan, or borrowed from him. The yellow dots indicate the entire concentration. It's yellow, so it's got to be sevoflurane, right? And the first dot is during a rapid rise of the entire sevoflurane concentration. The second one is on the fast decline of sevoflurane concentration, the end of the anesthetic. So we, we know that there is a time delay in uh, the brain partial pressure to become equilibrated with the alveolar partial pressure. And in the first case, when you have a rise in anesthetic concentration, you know that the, the brain partial pressure lags behind. So the brain partial pressure is much lower than in the second case where you have had a longer equilibration time. So the same entire concentration reflects in totally different brain partial pressures of sevoflurane. So we have to look at that a little bit more delayed. So we can accept that the depth of anesthesia is determined by the fraction in the vessel rich group if you use the gas man analogy. Uh, because the brain is part of the vessel rich group. So when alveolar partial pressure changes rapidly, the partial pressure in the brain takes time to equilibrate. And how much time it takes depends on the pharmacokinetics. And then we have to start to involve time constant. And a lot of people have a, have a problem with the concept of time constant, but I always explain it by a very simple experiment. You have a cup of black coffee and you pour in some milk. 
How long does it take before most of the coffee in your cup is gone and it's mainly milk? How long does it take? Well, first of all, it depends on the size of your cup. If you have a big cup and you pour in a little bit of milk, it's going to take a long time before the substance in your cup is white. And if you trickle it in very slowly, if you're just pouring in the milk, that's going to make an effect also. So the time constant uh, is a reflection of how fast that, that change occurs. Uh, this is an exponential process. And after one time constant, you see that you have a 63% equilibration, two time constants, three time constants, you have 95% equilibration. That's what we call uh, complete equilibration for practical purposes. So the time constant now is volume of the cup divided by flow. So a small volume of the cup and a large flow means that the time constant is very charged, very short. Very quickly your cup will be white, mainly milk. So that is the concept of time constant and you can have a mathematical exp uh, expression based on that that clearly describes the whole curve. So this is about pharmacokinetics, and then we obviously involved the four compartment model of eager, and what we have to do is, is determine how fast you have equilibration between the alveolar compartment and the vessel rich group, or in this case the brain, uh, or CNS I should say, um, through these arrows, which is uh, cerebral blood flow. So inhaled anesthetics are transferred according to a partial pressure gradient, which is an exponential process. It's perfusion limited, and it's clearly described by time constant. <coughs> so in this case, how can time constant, constant be calculated? Well, it, it's more complex than just the volume of the brain, because it also depends on the solubility of the agent into the uh, CNS tissue. So the, the capacity is determined by the size of the organ times the solubility of vapor in the organ. And now the flow into the brain is not just the amount of perfusion of, of the CNS, but it also depends on how much of the agent is dissolved in the, in the blood. And that depends on blood gas solubility. So the agent transport is determined by organ perfusion times blood solubility. So here are the factors that play a role on the right side, and it's easy to calculate time constant based on that. And the time constant are the following. About 2.9 minutes for isoflurane, 3.1, 2.3 for DES, and 2 minutes for nitrous oxide. And we call nitrous oxide still the fastest agent that will equilibrate with the CNS. Um, these are approximate numbers because the solubility of the agent in the CNS depends on what sample of, of the brain you take. The brain, we, we usually consider it to be a homogeneous tissue, but obviously it is not. So that's why you will see different solubilities reported for the, for the CNS. Uh, Ross Kennedy had uh, developed um, kind of an assist device that in, uh, it's a real time in real time, the computer derived the effect side partial pressure. So he took the four compartment model, he took the time course of the alveolar partial pressure, and he calculated what the instantaneous fraction of the inhaled anesthetic would be in the, in the CNS. Uh, he incorporated, incorporated all these factors that play a role, and he, that allowed him to make a forward prediction also, not just an in, instantaneous concentration or partial pressure of agent in the CNS, but also do a forward prediction of uh, the fraction in the CNS if uh, alveolar partial pressure didn't change. And that's what the computer looked like. It's always just sitting on top of in his anesthesia machine, and in gray here, you have the, um, the inspired and the expired uh, vapor pressure. And the boxes at the bottom result uh, uh, pressure to vapor pressure in the CNS. So this gave him an instantaneous idea of what the uh, depth <coughs> of anesthesia was. There is a new concept now that has been introduced by some of the companies, and that is called MacBrain. 
And intuitively, it, it's immediately clear that it reflects the depth of anesthesia. We, we know about the MAC concept. We know that the effect of inhaled anesthetic is on the CNS or the brain. Um, so we kind of understand what MAC brain means. It's the instantaneous depth of anesthesia monitor. Um, so a simple definition could be that the MAC brain is the effect site partial pressure at CNS <coughs> expressed as a fraction of MAC. That could be a useful definition. The problem is now MAC means minimal or median. Alveolar concentration. What does alveolar concentration have to do with the brain? We know what it means intuitively, but conceptually this, this term doesn't make a lot of sense. So how can we come up with uh, other definitions of uh, MAC brain? Um, so the simple definition is MAC brain is the entire fraction that reflects the depth of anesthesia, assuming that there is a total equilibration between uh, entire concentration and CNS partial pressure, uh, no time delay. But we know there is a time delay, and we know that concentration is not really a good term when you talk about tissue partial pressure. So I came up with a different definition of MAC brain, and it, and it becomes quite complex actually after, but when you try to make a correct definition using the proper terminology, you come up with something that's almost non-workable. And Jan and I had hours of discussion about this definition, and it was clear that it's just not working. Trying to make the right definition of the term MAC brain is very hard to do. I defined it that the MAC brain is calculated as that entire concentration of the vapor expressed as a fraction of MAC that would result in the actual same uh, partial pressure in the CNS after full equilibration, three time constants. <coughs> so this definition would take care of the time delay. It was, would also take care of the partial pressure gradients uh, from alveoli to arterial to tissue. It would take care of all that. But it's clear that it's not really a workable definition. So um, we came up with, with uh, the simple solution. We just leave the term MAC brain at what it is. We understand what it means intuitively. And that's it. Let's leave it at that. So my second conclusion of the talk is that the MAC brain helps us to estimate the depth of anesthesia in real time. It does consider the effects it, it should be, it does consider the effect of age and nitrous oxide, um, but it does not consider the effect of co-administered drugs other than nitrous oxide. So we have to take that into account ourselves. So my conclusion is um, there is no such thing as uh, MAC reduction. I think it's a misnomer. And secondly, uh, we have to be careful when we introduce new concepts such as MAC brains, because sometimes these new concepts only intuitively make sense, but creating a solid definition may be very, very hard to do. Thank you. <laughs>